our theme has been greater things be done in 2021. And that's based upon a promise of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, greater things than these you will do. And he was telling the disciples that the greater things would be done. Now, we are a Jesus-built church. And by Jesus-built church, we mean that we are built upon the foundation of what Jesus said. He said, I will build my church. And uh, that was uh, based upon the confession of Peter when he said uh, that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. We are Jesus-built church. And we're built on the great confession that Jesus said, you are, uh, that the disciples said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And on that confession, we have built our church. Everyone who becomes a member of our church is a believer and has confessed that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. He is the Christ. The second part of the Jesus-built church is being built on the great commandment. And the great commandment says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. It's two aspects. The third part of a Jesus-built church is the Great Commission. Jesus said we are to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And so we, we, we're built on this, but today I think what we're going to be talking about is actually focusing on the Great Commandment. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, in John chapter 14, verse 12, Jesus has told the disciples, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing, and here it is, he will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Now, we've spelled out the last couple of weeks that these greater things, Jesus is referencing the fact that the church will do greater things. And so collectively, the church did. And when we looked at the first week of this, we've already covered that the church would have greater outreach. In fact, on the day of Pentecost, there were 3,000 people added to the church that was more converts than Jesus had in his three years of ministry on that one single day. Greater things, greater outreach. And one of the things that we want at Bethany Church is greater outreach. And the way we have greater outreach, we spelled out, is every one of us has got to share an invitation for people to come to church with them. Everyone has got to share with people an invitation for people to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. Even those who are viewing online, you've got to have Facebook parties. You've got to invite people to watch and see. That's the way we grow. We invite people to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. The church started with a greater outreach, just as Jesus had promised. Last week, we looked at the idea that the church had greater devotion, greater devotion. Primarily, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. And we went through the Apostles' Creed, and we, we talked about the Didache, and we talked about the teaching of the early church that was very Trinitarian in nature and exalting the Lord Jesus Christ. We have got to have greater teaching. If you know less this year than you did last year, then you have not grown in your faith. You need to be growing, and you're never growing unless you're sharing. You've got to be sharing what you learn. There was greater devotion to the apostles' teaching, to communion. Or, we, we listed several things. This week, I want to focus on greater experience. We are to experience our faith. It's not just to be in our heads. It's to be in our hearts. It's to be in our actions. It's to be in our activity. It's to be something that we take with us, not just on Sunday to church, but when we leave church, we take it with us into the community in which we live. One of the things that they experienced in the book of Acts was a greater awe. And I have here reverential awe because the text says this. We pick up in Acts chapter 2 where we left off in verse 43. Everyone was filled with awe. I love when I see a new believer come to Christ. A person accepts Jesus Christ as their Savior. They're so excited and enthused. And I told you about my friend. When I met him, he came to a men's 
prayer breakfast, and he was an unbeliever. And at that men's prayer breakfast, uh, we shared the gospel. And afterward, uh, uh, Russell says to me, he says, hey, I want to I talk to you. So I went into my study, and he said, I, I, I want to become a Christian. And so I went through passages I normally go through, kind of like the Romans Road, and I, I take them through Bible verses, and I said, well, what you got to do is you got to call on the name of the Lord to be saved. So you got to pray. So, man, the guy gets down on his knees, man. He's, he's, he's all into this. He prays, and he accepts Jesus Christ as his Savior. As soon as he's done, he jumps up, and he's jumping up and down. I mean, he's just jumping up and down in my office, man. He is so happy. Jesus forgave him of all of his sins. He had awe. He had awe. You know what the word awe means? It's phobos. Uh, we use this word in phobia. Some of you have claustrophobia, a fear of tight, closed spaces. So you don't want to get in an elevator, you'd rather take the stairs. You know, it's, it's that kind of, it's a fear. But it, it, it's not being afraid of something here. In this case, this fear is a fear of God. All of a sudden, you know in whose presence you have come. And you realize, I am in the presence of the living God. I find several places in the Old Testament, Moses and Isaiah, when they're in the presence of God, it's like, woe is me. David says, who am I in my house that you should so bless me? There, there is this reverential awe that breaks out in the church on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit has come and he's, he's filling the people. They've broken out and speaking in tongues. And, and, and there's this reverential awe that just overwhelms the whole church, the whole community. I notice that it is per, uh, a pervasive awe. Everyone was filled with awe. Wouldn't it be great if every single one of us came into church, like my friend Russell, just jumping up and down, you'd say it's a mosh pit here when we're singing, you know? That we, we, we are so excited because we've come, we're coming into the presence of God. Everyone in the church. This is the birth of the church. They're, they're all new believers. They're all enthused. They're all excited. They're all on fire. they got the fire of God and the Holy Spirit in them, and, and they're just enthused as can be. Everyone was filled with awe. Do you realize if we as a church were so filled, what the impact that we would have on our community, our, our, our state, our nation, our world, if, if we had that same enthusiasm that they had back then, that pervasive awe? I notice next that it's a wonderful awe. It says, and, and many wonders... Wonder is the idea that you just drop your jaw. Oh, are you kidding me? It's one of the three terms that are associated with miracles. Of course, we know in a miracle it takes a mighty power of God, right? God running his universe in an extraordinary way. Normally, when a person dies, they stay dead. But in a miracle, which took place in the Bible, a dead person was raised from the dead. That was God exerting his, his power in a rather unusual way, because normally when a person dies, they stay dead. Right? They, one of the terms is power of God. The second term is wonder. This term is used in Mark, it's used in Luke, it's used in John, it's used in several places. And what it is, it's the response of the people when a miracle, a mighty power of God is done. They have this jaw-dropping awe and wonder. They're amazed. They marvel. They say, wow. Now that takes place in two ways. It either generates faith in your heart, so you say, whoa, look what God has done, I believe. Or you're an adversary to Christ and say, we've got to kill this guy because he's doing things that are showing us up. And that was the Pharisees, the scribes, and the priests of Jesus' day. We got to get rid of him. We got to get rid of him. What I'm trying to say is every time the mighty work of God takes place, there is a reaction. No one stands neutral. 
You either are, whoa, God is doing something, or you resist what God is doing. You're never neutral, never neutral. Many wonders. Well, I wonder what some of these wonders were. When I read back up in the text, and I go to chapter 2 in the book of Acts, there in verses like 5, 6, 7, <clears throat> the apostles are filled with the Holy Spirit, and they begin speaking in tongues. The people then, they look and they're utterly amazed. Same word as wonder. They're, whoa, what is this? What is going on here? And they ask, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Now you've got to realize, Galilee would be like calling them rednecks. Galilee was the uneducated group in the north, not the south. They weren't from Judea, the more sophisticated clientele. These, these were the ruffians. They were uneducated, uncouth. And he said, well, aren't all these men who are speaking Galileans, they've not been schooled in, in other languages. How is it? How is it that each one of us hears them in his own native language? Now, you've got to realize, it's Pentecost. And the law required of all the Jews to Every male Jew is supposed to go back to Jerusalem for the celebration of Pentecost. And so Jerusalem is just filled with people from all over the world. Back in verse 5 of chapter 2, it says, oh, they're from every nation under God. They're every nation on the planet, they're there. They're representative. And then in this passage, he says, how is it that each of us is hearing them in his own native language? And then he starts listing them. First of all, he says, there's the people from the east, the Parthians, the Medes, the Elamites, the Mesopotamians. He said, listen, those eastern people, they're speaking Persian, they're speaking Akkadian, they're speaking Chaldean, they're speaking all those languages. You've got that group. Then there's those of us in Judea, probably referring to those speaking Hebrew. Hebrew. And he said, also those are from Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia. That would be due north of Jerusalem, Judea. And they said, hey, and there's people from Phrygia and Pamphylia. That's west of those due north. And they said, wait, wait. And there's people here from Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene. That's North Africa. He goes on and he says, and then the far west, we got visitors from Rome. And he said, I want you to know it's not just Jewish people. But the Jews in Rome were getting converts to Judaism, and their, their people from Rome are here. He goes on and he says, then there's some people from the sea, the Cretans. They're on the Isle of Crete. He goes on and he says, hey, listen, we got, we got people from the southeast. The Arabs are even here. Whoa. Are you getting the picture here? All these different languages going on, and it says, how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? A miracle's going on, folks. Peter gets up to preach, and somehow when he preaches, every person hears it in their own language. Now, he's not doing double talk and keep repeating himself 11 times, saying it in each of the different languages, but each one, when he speaks, if somehow in the ear the sound waves are changed and they're beating on those people's eardrums so that they are hearing the language in their own birth language. That's biblical tongues. It's a miracle. It's powerful. And they recognize it. And it says they were amazed. They marveled. They marveled. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders. They're amazed. Awe. Oh. Not only were they filled with awe over these many wonders, but they were also filled with awe over the many miraculous signs. This is the third term for a miracle. It's a mighty power of God. It always solicits a response. You're either totally in awe for it or totally in awe against it but it's also a sign. Every miracle is pointing. It is pointing. It is pointing to God. Always. In the Old Testament, it's pointing to like the parting of the Red Sea, that this is my people. 
I've I got a redemptive purpose here. I'm delivering my people from, from bondage. In the New Testament, every miracle is done. It's a sign. It is pointing to a truth that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. I know that from the book of John. John uses the term sign exclusively for his miracles, and there are seven of these listed. Let me go through them quickly. The first one is found in John chapter 2. Jesus is at a wedding feast in Cana of Galilee, and, and his mother comes to him and says, hey, they're out, of, they're out of wine. He says, hey, woman, what's that to do with me? And a little later, he says, hey, go fill up those six pots. They're huge, big pots. Fill them up with water. And then they draw from them, and as they pour the water into everyone's chalice, it turned from water to wine, and the text ends saying, and the disciples believed in him. You know, Jesus didn't do the miracles to be a crowd pleaser. He didn't do it just because people were thirsty and needed something to drink. The purpose is, the text says, it glorified Jesus and the disciples believed in him. Every miracle points to Jesus Christ from the New Testament on. They always point to Christ. The second one we find is a nobleman. The nobleman uh, comes to Jesus in John chapter 4, and, and he says, my son is sick. And, and he said, please come. And Jesus said, go. Your son is well. And the man leaves. He believes him. He leaves. He believes him. Jesus said it. He has spoken. It's the word of God. He goes, and when he gets there, his son is well, and he asks, at what time did he get well? And it was the exact time that Jesus said to him, your son is well. He believes, he believes. The next one is a man who was, born, who was a paralytic. I find this so fascinating. This is a sign. Jesus goes into the pool of Bethesda, and there's a man sitting there, and he says to him, he's been there for years. He, he says, do you want to be made well? Now, that's a pretty powerful question. And the answer to that is, right, yes. But he doesn't answer yes. This is what just blows me away. He is so used to his condition of being sick, he doesn't say, yeah, I want to get well. What do he say? I don't have anybody to put me in the pool. That's not what Jesus asked. And we do that all the time. Jesus has one thing for us, and we're asking for something else. No, no, he wants us he wants to heal us. He wants to help us. And we're saying, but Jesus, I need this over here. Jesus said to the man, take up your mat and walk. And he got up and he walked. Why? Because he believed. He believed. Now that creates a whole controversy that the rest of John chapter 5 is about because he did it on the Sabbath day. And the whole point was Jesus is trying to prove that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. He is God's son who's come in the flesh, and he has the power of God over sick people that, that he can heal them on the Sabbath. And what he is doing, he is doing the Father's business. He's God. He can do whatever he wants, anytime he wants. And they get all upset. Here, instead of marveling and accepting him, they're, wow, we don't like you. We don't like what you're doing. We come to the sixth chapter, and we find another sign. I mean, these signs are everywhere. The sixth sign is Jesus asked to the disciples because a great crowd is following him. And he says, hey, what are we going to give them to eat? And they said, we don't have enough. Boy, if, if we had a whole year's salary, we, we couldn't pay enough to get everybody something to eat. And then uh, Philip says, hey, I, yeah, Philip says, hey, we, I found this kid. He's got a, a sack lunch, uh, two fish, five loaves. And, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, oh, let's bless these and then we'll spread them out. And when they're all done, the 5,000 plus are well fed. It said they ate to their fill. They were full. And there were 12 basket loaves left over. They believed in him so much, the text says, they wanted to grab him and make him their king. And Jesus rebukes them because the only reason you want me is because your belly has been filled. You really don't want me to rule in your heart. This is followed up by another sign that's pointing to who Jesus is. He is, a, he is the Lord over all of nature. 
He went up on the high mountain to pray after that, and the disciples got in the boat and went across the Sea of Galilee. A storm arises in the sea, and Jesus, uh, seeing that they're about halfway across, decides to catch up with them. And so he starts walking on the water. I tell kids I can walk on water when it's frozen. <laughs> it doesn't freeze. The Sea of Galilee does not freeze. He's walking across, walking across, and then, then, then Peter looks out and says, uh, Lord, if that's you, invite me to come out on the water too. He said, come on out. And so Peter, I, I love this guy, he jumps out on the water. He starts walking. <laughs> He's walking on the water. And all of a sudden, the wind's blowing because, hey, there's a storm. I mean, that's, that's why they haven't made it across the sea. And, and all of a sudden, he looks at the storm, he begins to sink, and then he prays the shortest prayer in the Bible. Lord, help. And the Lord reaches down and says, Oh, ye of little faith, close them out of the water. Oh, ye of little faith, the miracle are about believing. About believing. About believing. The sixth one is a man who was born blind. Disciples ask, Who sinned? This man or his parents said he should be born blind. Jesus said, Neither. You're barking up the wrong tree. This man was born blind for the glory of God. I don't know what impediment you might have, one shortcoming, what handicap. I don't know. I mean, you, you, could, you could have what you think is a, a major problem, stuttering, I don't, I don't, whatever it may be. That you, you got the, he says it's for the glory of God. A spit on the ground, mixed a bit with the dirt, make, he makes an eye salve, and he anoints the man's eyes. Now, I've been to the eye doctor several times. He'd never spit and mix it with dirt and stuck it in my eye. <laughs> this was miraculous. He tells him to go and wash, and he went and he washed, and he came back seeing. And we're going to talk about this later in another message. Then we come to the seventh of these signs. You see, all, every one of these signs is if that they would believe. Even that last one, the man believed, he went and washed, and by the time you're done at the end of the miracle, you go through the whole chapter, chapter 9, you find that, that he is... He is confessing that Jesus is the Son of God. The last one of these seven in the book of John that are, are, are marked as signs is the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And they, he got there and, and they said, hey, he's been dead for four days. He stinks. But Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And they rolled away the stone and he comes wobbling out all wrapped up and they had to unwrap him. He raised him from the dead. You read the passage. Many believed, and the, those who were his adversaries tried all the harder to kill him. What? The marvel. The marvel. You were either for him or against him. Wow. Jesus said many other signs. The, the, the book of John ends like this. Jesus did many other miraculous signs. These seven are listed, but there were many more. But these are written that you might believe. Here's the whole point. of Every one of these miracles was so that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and by believing you might have life in his name. They're all about believing in Jesus. Now, these continue in the book of Acts. There's what happened on the day of Pentecost. Peter healed the lame man. He said, silver and gold have I none, but as much as but what I do have, in the name of Jesus, arise and walk. And the man gets up and he walks. Ananias and Sapphira... They sinned against the, the Holy Spirit, and in the presence of Peter, they dropped dead. You see why there was such reverential awe? Whoa. Why there was this reverential fear in the church? They saw God meant business. Peter heals a man of palsy. Peter raises Tabitha from the dead. Uh, you go on. Herod is smitten dead. Uh, Paul is converted. He sees Jesus crashes into his experience. Elymas is smitten with blindness, and Tychus, I like this one, this is a great story, Tychus in the book of Acts, Peter's preach. I mean, Paul is preaching. I don't know if it was the evening service or the morning service, but about midnight, Eutychus falls asleep, <laughs> and he's on the third story, sitting on the windowsill, and he falls out into the street, and he hits himself on the ground, and he's dead. Paul, who's been preaching till midnight, goes down and raises him from the dead. And then they go, all go back up to the third story, and he preaches from midnight until sunrise. 
and you think I preach long. <laughs> all night long. All night long. Listen, what I'm trying to say is, God was doing miraculous things at the time of Jesus and the time of the apostles. Miracles were abounding, and it caused them to have a miraculous awe. And I want to add this, because it says they were done by the apostles. They were done by the apostles. Read through the book of Acts. You find it's the apostles that are doing all the miracles. Not everybody could perform a miracle. These apostles were special individuals that God had called. The word apostle means to be sent on a mission. Actually sent with a commission. Jesus actually sends them out to spread the word. They were unique individuals. According to the first chapter of Acts, they had qualifications. They had to be men who had been with the disciples the whole lifetime of Jesus. Well, he's referring to his ministry lifetime. They're saying they had to be with Jesus. They had to be one of the followers of Jesus. The second thing is they had to be witnesses of his resurrection. They had to see Jesus who was raised from the dead with their own eyewitness. So they had to live with Christ. They had to have seen the resurrected Christ. And the third thing, they had to be chosen by God. Actually, it was they cast a lot to replace Judas with Matthias. They cast a lot, and that's the way they determined what, which one God wanted to fill the place of Judas to be among the twelve. Three things. And I know what anybody is thinking that uh, knows a little bit about the Bible. Well, what about the Apostle Paul? Apostle Paul, in a way, meets all three of these, but the one that's really questioned is the first one. To have been with him the whole time from John the Baptist until, you know, the resurrection, uh, he was an unbeliever at that time. But Paul himself says about himself, last of all, Jesus appeared to me also as one abnormally born. He's saying, I am the unusual exception to this rule. He appeared to me, for I'm the least of all the apostles. And I do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. He said, but God called me. Jesus appeared to me. And I did live during that time. I was not a follower of Jesus, but I was studying in the temple. And I'm sure their paths had crossed. This makes me suspect of those who call themselves apostles today. How can you be an apostle today if you didn't live with time of Jesus? You didn't see the resurrected Christ, and he didn't call you. Just because you think you are, does it make you one? These were the apostles. Wow. There was this great awe because God was doing something massively awesome in the church. And that's what I long for. God to do something massively awesome at Bethany Church. Bethany Church. The next part of the, the, the verse goes to a greater experience of unity. They all were experiencing this greater sense of awe, fear, reverence for God. They were pumped up. But they also had this greater unity. A unity of believers. It says all the believers, all of them. He's not, not excluding any. These were people from all these different nations who that day accept Christ. They get baptized. They join the church. All these believers, he says here, they were together. They met together. COVID-19 has done more to disrupt the church than anything in my whole lifetime. It has divided the body of Christ. It's divided us by not being able to meet together. And I understand. I understand. I understand that if you're old, you've got some other health issues, that this virus is deadly. I know that. Here I am. A, I'm an uncle, and I have a nephew. And my nephew is in his 50s. So that tells you I'm a little older. I had COVID. Oh, my goodness. 
My wife doesn't think it was fair. I had a little bit of a sore throat. I had a little pressure behind my eyes, like I thought a sinus infection was coming on. And I was tired. My nephew's been hospitalized for a week with it. We have other friends hospitalized 196 days. Whoa. I understand the fear that grips us, but somehow, some way, we have to stay together. And that's why those of you who are watching online, it is so important that you meet at the same time, same place, that you're watching us so that you have that connection of meeting with us, being together with us, being a part of us. It's important that you continue to send your offerings in because you're still attached uh, financially to us. It's important that you continue to go down the prayer list and pray with us that the one that's not printed there on, on the bulletin that you can, you can print off You've got to stay together with us. I know how easy it is to say, well, you know, I'll just watch a little later. <laughs> and that's okay, but it's not the best. You want to say, I, I saw you live. I was there in spirit. We're together because they had a unity. That's, that's part of this greater experience. I'm part of you. And it says, and they had everything in common. They were sharing everything. Koinonia, sharing everything in common. Sharing the apostles' teaching, sharing communion, sharing the baptism, sharing... Go down the line. They were sharing it all together. They were sharing not only all the experiences, but the text is going to go on and say that they were sharing their stuff. They were selling their possessions and goods. I, mean, I put a garage sale sign up here. I don't know if they had garages for their camels. I think they called them, you know, stables. But uh, they had a stable sale. They put out all the stuff. You know what's been going on? Open door, you name it. You name the group. That takes in, they got a store where they, you, they, they have secondhand stuff. During COVID, we had so much time on our hand, everybody went through. They went through their closets. They went through all their shoes, their clothes. Uh, they went through their garages, and they cleaned because they were locked down. What else can you do? So they cleaned, and they started taking to these places and dropping it off. They have so much stuff, all of them. Man, I, I pulled into one, they, were, so they said, listen, we're, we're, so, we're so full, we, we can't take it. So I drove to another one. The line went completely around the building of all the cars. I said, I don't have the time. So I took all my junk back home. I said, a later time I can take my junk there. You know what I'm trying to say, though? We have so much stuff that we don't need. These people realized I have accumulated stuff I don't need. I can sell it, and I can give it to the cause of Christ. Wow. There was another motivating factor here. Jesus, as he ascended into heaven, two men in white and shining apparel appeared. They were angels. And the disciples, when Jesus ascended into heaven in a cloud, and they're all looking up, and, they're all, and then they look down, and here's these two guys. Whoa, where'd they come from? And these angels say... Hey, you men of Galilee, why are you standing gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus that has been taken up into heaven is going to come back in the same manner as you've seen him go. Whoa, the angels, wow, that was marvelous. Huh? That, was, that was incredible. That was a miracle, angels appearing. They said Jesus is coming back. Well, all these people that gathered in Jerusalem, they said, we're not leaving. Jesus is coming back. They rearrange their whole lifestyle. <clears throat> you know, when, when, when I go on a trip, if I go to vacation to Florida, I take enough with me to last the week or two that I'll be there, right? These people went to Jerusalem. They took enough to last the time that they would be there for Pentecost and then return. <clears throat> well, they're hanging around for Jesus. And now they're running out of stuff. Uh, wait a minute. My, they don't have an American Express. Uh, they don't have a Visa, a MasterCard, a they run on out of, they're running out of cash. These people are saying, whoa, we got a brother here. This brother's suffering. 
We, we need to help him. And so, tell you what, I'll go sell a piece of property. I'm not going to need this property. Jesus is coming. I don't need this property. So they sell the property, take the money, let's buy food. Hey, you guys, you need some food? They are sharing everything in common. They're selling every, all their possessions because they believe Jesus is coming back. You know what it would do to your life and my life if I really believed Jesus was coming back today? The pastor was sitting with all the elders of the church at a meeting. He said, how many of you here believe Jesus is coming back? Oh, everyone raised their hand. He said, keep them up. He said, now, how many of you believe he's coming back today? They all went down. And then he quoted this verse. In such an hour as you think not, even so cometh the Son of Man. We know it in our heads, but are we living it in our hearts? Am I living today as if I really believe Jesus is going to show up at my door today? Today. They were. They were. And it said, they gave to anyone as he had need. Now, anyone can be taken two ways. Anyone among those believers <clears throat> or just plain out anyone. The text doesn't really specify that for us. Our emphasis this month is on Hope Warming Center. My goodness, in all the junk that I have, I could sell something off. I could buy some coffee, I could buy some hot chocolate, and I could get some disposable cups for somebody out there who has nothing, living on the street. I know what it says. If a man will not work, neither should he eat. I don't know if that person is will not or cannot. If it's a matter of their will or their ability. Some of them are mentally unstable enough that they can't. I would rather err on the side of grace and help the person than withhold the help that they need. We have a helping hands fund. And that Helping Hands Fund, we're coordinating also with Open Door to help them when there's a big, real, legitimate need. And when one organization can't handle it, we will kick in with them also to help that legitimate need. Isn't that what the Christian community is supposed to do? I put an envelope in every bulletin today that you can give to the Helping Hands to help us help those who are in need. There is a unity of sharing in the experience of the church like nothing ever before. I see a pattern here. I do, I see a pattern here. Greater awe, fear of God, relates back to the love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. There's a pattern. The more I love the Lord, the more I am in awe of him. The second part of the pattern is greater unity. The more I love my neighbor as myself, the greater the unity in the body of Christ. Greater unity because you love your neighbor as yourself. So what do we take away from all of this? Book of Acts, God was doing miraculous, powerful things uh, that we've not seen since the day of Acts because we have no apostles. And we only have sinful preachers. And, and I'm a sinner too like all the rest. I'm no different than you. I, I, God just called me to, to preach. But what do we take away from all of this? God was doing such amazing things in the early church. Well, I take away this. I want to experience great things too. I just don't want a humdrum church experience. I don't want a, just a humdrum Bible reading experience. I don't want a humdrum prayer life. I want to see the power of God working and, and drop, making me drop my jaw and say, whoa, look what God is doing. That's what I want. How do I get that? I've got to have greater awe, which means I've got to love the Lord. I mean, I've got to love the Lord. I gotta get that burning fire in my heart for the Lord. I, I just gotta love the Lord. And the second thing I gotta do is I gotta have greater unity. 
for us all together to love our neighbor as ourselves, we will find what they had in the book of Acts, and we will stand amazed at what God will do at Bethany. And I'm convinced he's going to do greater things in 2021 than he has done in the years in the past. Our glory days are ahead. You say, but the, the times are so depressing. God raised us up for such a time as this. God raised us up so that we will be a beacon and a lighthouse. And the darker the days, the brighter our light. The brighter our light. We just have to be that light. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I do pray that we will have awe of you like they had in the book of Acts. That you will do your, your powerful, miraculous things like they did in Acts. And answer to our prayers, not because we have apostles. I pray, Father, that there would be such unity that we would, we would be willing to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Just as Jesus laid down his life for us. Lord, that we would love you with all our heart and we'd love our neighbor as ourselves. Work that in our hearts, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.